I'm happy to have Mark Harrison here, who is one of the co-founders of Spiral Tribe, and I'll be asking a few questions along the lines of the questions that uh, Neil Transfontein asked in the uh, interview with Mark, which is in, in the new issue of Datasite. I don't know if you want to shout out I, I introduce work, yourself. I work. It's good. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, I'm Mark. Um, I was part of the Spiral Tribe uh, sound system uh, from the very beginning in the early uh, 90s. Uh, we began a very interesting journey from uh, sort of squat land of, um, of uh, West London um, in vehicles, uh, which ended up um, sort of touring the UK and uh, then beyond into um, Europe. And um, I realized as I was writing this sort of uh, very brief little history for a data site, it was very interesting the way uh, that that journey moved through uh, different spaces, uh, spaces that perhaps we didn't actually realize had edges or existed until we crossed the line. So uh, that's uh, my little introduction. So I'd like to start uh, questions with um, the prehistory of, of Spiral Tribe rather than uh, you know the actual history. We'll get to that in a, in a moment. What kind of... Um, uh, influences did you have? What where were like the roots of the free party culture in in the UK? Um, going back obviously to the 70s at least, and to Stonehenge, the free uh, free festivals, all the hippie festivals throughout the 70s, and so I'm sure you know uh, a lot about this. Well, I do, because uh, my brother and I were teenagers um, in the 70s, and uh, I think I was probably 14 or uh, 15 when I first hitchhiked down to uh, one of the very first Stonehenge um, festivals. I mean, we were very lucky to uh, witness those. Um, we didn't really know uh, what it was or what it was all about or the history that had sort of built into uh, Stonehenge uh, Festival, but it had become a kind of uh, hub, a sort of meeting place uh, for a kind of free-flowing, um, exploring uh, alternative uh, culture. This was round about uh, sort of punk time, 76, I think, was probably the first time uh, we went there. And uh, I think I went to every single one right up until the bitter end in 19... Uh, 84, where it was absolutely enormous, and um, there was a, 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 a huge amount of um, uh, interest, shall we say, from the authorities to try and uh, destroy uh, what they saw as a, a sort of rebellion occurring in the, uh, in the countryside. Uh, and uh, that ended uh, very tragically with the uh, Battle of the Beanfield. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Uh, when uh, in the 1985, or en route to the 1985 uh, Stonehenge Festival, uh, I think it was June the 1st, uh, the police um, ambushed 140 travel vehicles. Uh, they were called the Peace Convoy. They, they'd uh, uh, originated um, a sort of uh, a, a peaceful uh, protest uh, convoy um, on Greenham Common, where the uh, first uh, American um, uh, cruise missiles were going to be based in England, so it was all part of the anti-war and um, uh, peace movement. Uh, and anyway, on uh, June 1st, uh, uh, in the bean field, uh, the uh, travellers were ambushed and uh, brutally attacked um, by uh, riot police. Um, and that more or less uh, didn't squash the movement, uh, but uh, it polarised uh, a lot of things and of course brought the media, uh, the mainstream media, uh, into uh, um, alignment uh, with the government policy um, of the time. I'm sure it also was like um, in a context of the Thatcher government clamping down on other unruly communities like the miners and, and for example, I mean, it's it certainly a part of the logic of the government to, to stamp out these kind of communities that were not um, in the logic of capital. That well, this was actually happening at exactly the same moment, of course. 
and uh, many of the riot police uh, squads that were um, attacking uh, the travellers and uh, the free festival movement had just come off shift after fighting the miners. So how did, what happened after Battle of the Beanfields between, let's say, 86, uh, well, middle of the decade and 90 when Spiral Tribe uh, appeared on the scene. Well, that was that was kind of interesting because I think what the uh, government uh, w weren't sort of counting for uh, was acid house music uh, and uh, ecstasy and uh, that kind of uh, culture uh, of electronic uh, music that was uh, very creative uh, and uh, was uh, very much looking for open space, free space, warehouses, uh, fields, things like this. Uh, where it could just sort of uh, move into and uh, and grow into this whole new movement, and it rather sort of escaped uh, the, the 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 political stamp, uh, if you like, of the the, the peace convoy, uh, the way the uh, media had successfully uh, demonised uh, the travellers' movement, etc. But it had a lot in common, but it was completely different and completely new. So from 87, 88, uh, you had this, you know, sudden, huge, uh, uh, energetic, and for the most part, secret uh, uh, rise uh, in this uh, new creative uh, energy. I mean, it wasn't for at least two or three years that police actually even realised uh, the extent of ecstasy use, for example, in, uh, in uh, England, uh, and get any kind of measure uh, of the scale, uh, and I think I'm right in saying that this only occurred when the brewery industry, uh, which is a very powerful uh, lobby uh, in the British government, uh, noticed that their uh, alcohol sales to uh, youngsters, the young people, had dropped by 30% uh, in the late uh, 80s, and uh, everybody was just leaving the pubs and the clubs and disappearing, uh, well, nobody knew where. <laughs>